Uh, it's been so it's been an interesting journey. I know the last few weeks Pastor Chuck was here. Did y'all enjoy Pastor Chuck? Doesn't he do an awesome job? I really enjoy him. So I was glad he was here the last couple of Sundays, and I really appreciate him. So as today, I was so it was so amazing as I was going through the message and seeing we were in chapter 14 that God coincided the baptisms with today because I, pa I planned out the message a long time ago and here the baptisms fell on this Sunday and I thought fork in the road that's a perfect Sunday for baptism because that's when they're making a decision so I thought thank you God I don't even have to work on this one hardly he's done it he always does it all anyway so as we continue as we look at this, it says, you know, Gary and I were, as you know, we're on vacation the last few weeks, and we, had, we, we traveled over 6,000 miles in the car, um, all the way from here to southwest Montana. We kind of go up and around, and however, um, we do a lot of this, because we never, seldom are on the interstate. We do, Gary, when we're on the interstate, the pictures look terrible, because I'm going like 80, and Gary's taking pictures of elevators and things out the window. So he does go back and delight, de delete most of those, <laughs> but what? And he took 1,627 pictures on vacation. So that's what my other <laughs> So we had a good time, though. And, but one of the things we've learned over the years is when we're taking some of these roads, GPS is worthless because there's no internet. We're in the mountains. We're in rural areas. And a couple of times, I totally lost the connection, and Carol said, where are we going? I go, I, you're, we're going to just wing it like we used to. He gets his map out. But we'll come to a fork in the road, you know? And you'll have to decide which way is the right direction. Because it doesn't actually, especially on a lot of those rural roads, there is, they aren't on the map either. There's just a squiggly line. And you think, OK, and, you know, is that gravel or is it paved? We found out one was like 10 miles paved, uh, 10 miles of gravel we went on. It was a lot of gravel. Um, and we, got, we got there. It wasn't bad gravel. I didn't have to go too slow. But, you know, you get there, and you have to make a decision when you get to that fork in the road. There's just no going around it. One time we were up on our honeymoon, we were up on this mountain called Ram's Horn. And I'd never been in the mountains before. In fact, I'd never been um, west of Minnesota before. So we're up in these mountains in Montana, and we're going up in this big red pickup, and we got to the top. It was just a beautiful view. We got to the top of this mountain, we got to, it was a pretty narrow two-track road going up. And we get up there, and it's so cool because you can get to the edge, and you can touch the tops of the pine trees down there because that's how high we were above the tree line up there. It was so cool. But then we looked around and realized we were at the end of the road, and there was nowhere to turn around. He had, we had to back up a good half mile. He did. I got out and walked it so I could help him go back. Because this side is straight down to where those trees were. And the other side was like a mountain, you know, the big hill. It wasn't fun. But we enjoyed it. We figured it was an adventure. Now I can talk about it 36 years later. <laughs> but, it, but that's when you learn. You're, you're learning stuff. You're finding ways to go different directions. But literally, you have to make a decision about where you're going. And it wasn't a life and death situation. But there are those as well. There's a story, a short story about a prince, it was called The Lady and the Tiger. I read it in high school. I don't know how many of you might have read it. And it was about these two doors. And the guy, the prince had to pick a door. Behind one door was the princess. And if he picked the right door, they would get married. They would live happily, after, happily ever after. And he would have the entire kingdom. He picked the other door. There was a hungry, ravenous tiger that would eat him. And he had to choose a door. Now, that's a life and death decision, right? He didn't have an option. He had to choose. I don't remember how. And it's one of those stories that you get to pick the door. And I don't remember how it turned out. I don't remember what I picked. That was a long time ago. But I remember thinking, oh, boy. And, and no decision was a decision, because obviously he wouldn't get either thing. But imagine those are the kinds of decisions that sometimes we make. Most of our decisions in life are more like the ones that um, Robert Frost wrote about in Two Roads Diverge, The Road Not Taken. It's called Two Roads Diverge in a Yellow Wood. And sorry, I could not travel both. And 
B1 traveler along I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden in black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I ever should come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two, day, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. When we make a decision, it makes a difference. How do you handle the forks in the road that you come to? Do you fearlessly just pick one and go? Or are you one of those that kind of debates and you kind of get, you kind of try for the middle and get stuck? Or do you just sit there and think about it for a really, really long time? We need to make choices. This is decision time. Chapter 14 of Revelations is definitely decision time. There may be no more opportunities to change your mind past this point in Revelations. So as we read these, God sends, we're going to be looking at Revelations 14, verses 6 to 13. And we're going to, there's three messages, there's three angels in this passage that are delivering messages that John is going to see. If you want to follow along in the Pew Bibles, it's page 999. Or it'll be up on the screen as, as, as always. And this is where we are. So then I saw another angel. This is John flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, fallen, fallen is Babylon, the the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships a beast in its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast in its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. These angels have brought three messages, messages that anticipate and summarize the seven bowls of judgment that will be coming very soon. This is kind of the prequel. He's getting everybody ready. When these bowls are poured out, they will be the completion and the end of the world as we know it. So that's what this is the precursor towards as this first angel brings about these messages. And this angel the first angel brings about a positive message. God likes to give us positive. He likes to encourage us. In the first part, this first angel's message is a, is a positive one because often he likes to soften those negative ones, but he also wants, to, wants us to share us those positive things that, are, that he wants us to know. And as he shares that, he, the angel says, he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Because he's proclaiming it to every person in the world. That's every living person, every language, every tribe, every nation. This nation is for all people. All people. He wants them to know that it's not too late. You still have a chance. You still can choose to follow Jesus. It's that fork in the road. It's that time to go forward. It's time to choose. I, he, God says, I love you, I have a plan for you. And he said in a fear, you know, he says, fear God and give him glory. Now, it's not the fear that says, you know, to be afraid of him. It's the fear of respect, that he's the authority, he's the one in control, he is victorious. 
to have respect for him because he loves him. He wants all people to be in heaven with him. He doesn't want anybody to choose that other fork. But he gave us free will. He gave us the choice. So he wants to reward those that are following him, and he will punish those that choose not to. He is he as the creator, he's a sustainer, and he has earned that right as the one that has created this, created each one of us as we make those choices. Paul was eager to share the good news as well as like this angel did in Romans 1, 15 to 23. He starts with, that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel and also to you who are in Rome. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from the heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what we may what since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that the people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. So when Paul is saying, I, I, I'm here to preach the gospel. I want everybody to know But there are those that will continually choose to do it their own way or to choose their own gods and to follow them. But Paul said, I have to preach the good news, the good news of the gospel. The good news saves everyone who believes. For anyone, everyone. That's the best news they've ever. God proves, has provided the answer for our sin. He has provided the answer for the corruption in this world, for the pain in this world, for the evil in this world. He has provided the answer because it is him. He will take care of it. He will take care of our sin, our moral failures. He will take care of our backsliding. If we just come to him and believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus' words to Nicodemus are just a vivid reminder of what it's all about. Um, There should have been a video. We must back it up and do it again. There it is. I I believe. You You are are not not acting acting alone. alone. No No one can can do do these signs you do without having having God in him. him. Only Only someone someone who has come come from from God. God. And now is that belief going over in the synagogue? synagogue. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Which is why we are here at this hour. What What else? What What have you come come here here to show us? A kingdom. kingdom. That That is what our rulers are are worried worried about. Not that that kind. kind. Then what? A sort sort of kingdom that that a person person cannot see. see. Unless Unless he is born born again. Born again. Yes. Yes. You You mean mean, a a a new creature? creature? A conversion, conversion from, from Gentile to Jewish? No, 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 no that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Then what is born again? again? I, I hope you don't, don't mean return, return to the womb, womb because that would be a problem, problem for me. me. My, My mother, if she rest in peace, peace, is dead. Truly, Truly I, say I say to you, unless, unless one, one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot, cannot enter, enter the kingdom of God. God. That, that which is born of the flesh is the flesh. And that that which is born of the spirit is the spirit. That that part of that that is what what must be reborn into a new life. How can these things be? 
proclaims his message of fearing God and following him and turning to him, it's because the hour of judgment has come and he doesn't want any to perish. Here is fork in the road decision time. The hour of judgment has come. As the time draws near, it's going to be too late. It's going to be a time of choosing Jesus and taking that fork or it's going to be the time of going the other way. There is no in-between. For those that have accepted Christ, this is a good thing because they're finally seeing justice. They're finally knowing that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and we're going to be in heaven. This world is going to be redeemed and changed and we get to be a part of it. Yet for those that are choosing the other fork, choosing to go in their own way, it will be the last thing they choose. And there will be a time of darkness and, and death forever for them. Even though Christians often are believers, those that follow Jesus, have a hard time. It doesn't say life's going to be easy. A lot of times it's a pretty rocky path. Sometimes we fall off our way and end up having to come back and get detours. But the awesome, most wonderful thing about that is the most amazing thing, that God still loves us. And he wants us to turn back to him. And he will redeem us and bring us back. But at the end of all those things, no matter how difficult the path, total, the end is totally worth it. The end is totally worth it. God is the victor, and he has heaven all in his hands. And he has us in the palm of his hands, and he loves us. For those that are, it seems like sometimes the bad guys are winning and everything's going easy for them. And if you look around, you know, awesome, a lot of times in our, even our own culture and things that are going on, we think, when will this get better? When will, the, when will they get what they deserve? And we think, you know, but they're missing out on a lot. We, we can enjoy Jesus here and have faith. We can have peace. We can have the Holy Spirit power living in us. We can be free from guilt and free from sin in our lives, where they can only imagine those things. They can only try to find substitutes for those things, where we have the real deal all the time. And that's what we're celebrating. That's what we're celebrating today as well. John wrote in his first letter that we can have the assurance of our salvation. For those of us that are believers that we've accepted Christ, we can know for sure that we're going to be in heaven with him someday. In 1 John 5.13, John wrote, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. We don't have to wonder when we get to the end. We can know that we're his. During those end times, during our most difficult times, we can remember we're with Jesus and that he is our God and that we're following him. Today, today we're celebrating baptism. 
Baptism is one of the sacraments that Jesus Christ gave us, and he modeled for us, too. He was baptized by John the Baptist, not because he was a sinner, but because he wanted to show us that he was the son of God and the son of man, that he would go under and that he would show that as a representative, that he would die for our sins and he would be raised to life again. And that is what he is calling us to do as people. In, in the Wesleyan discipline, it reads, we believe that water baptism is a sacrament of the church commanded by our Lord and administered to believers. It is a symbol of the new covenant of grace and signifies acceptance of the benefits of the atonement of Jesus Christ. By means of this sacrament, believers declared their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. Paul wrote, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Colossians 2.12 we are celebrating lives changed and wanting to give a visible testimony to their church and their family today by their faith and their renewed and new commitments to follow Jesus. We have three people today that are making forks in the road decisions. I'd like them to come up right now and share their testimony with us. Did you turn it off, Henry? Where do you turn it? I don't want to turn it off. Here. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right, I'm going to get out of the way and let you guys share. Ladies first. <laughs> okay, get over there by Jimmy. There we go. Start out. I actually got. Baptized. You have to put it up by your mouth. Okay. So. I, there you go. I was actually baptized when I was nine years old, um, and I am choosing to get baptized again today because I, I definitely made more choices in my life without God's guidance. And um, once I decided to look straight to God for all the things in my life, I, it it made a huge difference, and I've grown so much in that, and want to be able to be a servant for God specifically done working for man, done working for me, and looking to serve the Lord. And I even said that I wanted to be the answer to someone's prayers. And I just recently took a job, and I was told that yesterday, <laughs> that I was the answer to their prayers. So even in the small things, God is working. In the bad decisions I've made through my life, he was still there and always kept me headed in a good direction, even when it didn't always look that way. So hopefully, from here on out, I will always be guided and it can and be for the glory of God. You going next, Alex? <laughs> I, too, was baptized when I was younger, although I don't remember it. I also went to church when I was younger but did not fully accept what it meant. So I'm just reaffirming my faith in Jesus Christ today by being baptized. And then hopefully the church will all be within me, too. Why I want to get baptized is because I left church and then I came back and I forgot all about Jesus. And Jesus called up to me and asked me, why did I leave? And I didn't know why. And that's why... It, <laughs> And that's why I'm getting baptized today, to connect with Jesus again. Thank you. I'm going to give you these. These are devotion books because you, it won't be easy right away. In fact, because you made this statement today, you're going to be challenged way more than you thought you were going to. So I think they all need your support. So as a group, do you say you're going to come alongside and encourage these and support them in the days ahead? If you are, I'd like you to just really give a round of applause to God and to these three people. It takes a lot of courage. You can go sit down. All right. So in about after we have lunch today, we're going to be in the river, and, and we will be baptizing them today. So. 
So we are so glad you, the Zumbro River down at Reed's, Point, Reed's Park. One of these days I'm going to say Reed's Landing, then we'd be in the Mississippi. All right, <laughs> okay. All right. So we state by our baptism that we are being buried with him, that we're dying to sin, that we are going to live a new life for him. That's what it's all about, being renewed and making new commitments to follow Jesus. This is a fork in the road decision. You know, all of us can make that. In fact, today, if you feel that is something that God is calling you to, I would challenge you to say yes and come forward as well, and we would certainly baptize you today as well. It's not like it's, we put a ceiling on it today. God works in mysterious ways and moves our heart. Sometimes when we're not, we're least expecting it. But that's when God works. But he has, I'd like, you know, as they come and shared, he was, Jesus was in the tomb for three days and he defeated death. He defeated death. And he rose again to be our savior, to show that he is God and that he can provide the payment for our sins in our lives. Now, as I said, these three, as believers, as people that have gotten baptized, uh, will be getting baptized, they're stating right before you guys and before, their, and before God and before Satan that they're going to live for God. And you know what? Satan is not happy today. He is angry, and he's going to do his best to try to take them down and to turn them away. And that's when we need to encourage them. We need to be praying for them, and we need to remember that God is still the victor and that he will continue to be. Will everything be easy for be, be easy once you get baptized? No. Nope. Doesn't make life perfect. Doesn't change you overnight. You're still the same person you were when you came in here. But you have the Holy Spirit living in you. And you've made a commitment. And God is there with you. And he'll help you in the days ahead. You will be different because the Holy Spirit lives in you and will be that power from today on. This is the beginning of your journey. You're not there yet. This is the beginning of your journey to continue to follow God. And as you surrender to him every single day, then he will live in you and he will help you. As we continue on our journey, I want you to be thinking, what fork are you on? Where are you at this fork in the decision time? Let's go back to Revelation 14. That second angel has a very short message. It just says, fallen, fallen. Babylon is falling, and which made the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. It's only one verse. But he says, this is the end of the Antichrist and his and, and everything. This is the end. We've taken care of it. It's gone. And it will be the end of the evil, reign of the Antichrist is, at for, is forever gone. Now, we don't know exactly what the three Babylons, I mean, the Babylon is. It could be a literal reenactment of Babylon has been rebuilt, and that's where, the, where he lives, and that's where the Antichrist has set up his kingdom. That's possible that he went back and rebuilt Babylon. It could be that it's, um, no, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, it could be that uh, it could be Rome. It could be that it's a symbol of what Rome or another power is. Or thirdly, it could be, a country that we have no idea who it is. It could be just the name for that country because we still don't know who the Antichrist is. So it's something that we'll find out when that time comes. But we don't know who it is yet. But that's one of the, those are the three views of what that could be in this time period. But we don't know. All we know is it says it's going to be, it's fallen and it's over. Finally, the Antichrist is taken out and done. Okay, there is no, and then this, the last angel proclaims two messages, basically, a two-part message. In verses 9 to 11, it says, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives its mark on their foreheads or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night, for those who worship the beast or its image. This is the verdict. This is the ending of those that have been following their own way, those that have taken this, the other fork in the road, those that have chosen the road to hell, the road that is away from Jesus. 
that's the direction. You know, it break, breaks God's heart. It breaks our heart that people choose that. But that is part of this message today because that's the way it, because that's what's going to happen. Jesus said there is no option. There's only two things. There's only two options, heaven or hell. There's no in between. You have to choose one. Making no decision is the same as making a decision. Which, because you never know when that day will come. You don't know what will happen after you leave here today. It depends on what's in your heart today where you end up. The choices that you have, the choice that you have made. Jesus said, seek first my kingdom. And every, all these things will be added unto you. All these things, all the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. I will give you those things. Follow me. Follow me. Put me first. Surrender your life to me, and I will be with you forever. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit's power will come in and make us a new person. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We can choose to follow Jesus. Or we can choose not to. He does give us the choice. I had somebody ask me about why does he give us free will? Why didn't he just make us all go to heaven? Well, that would be convenient. <laughs> but think about it. Would you want to have somebody that loved, would you want somebody to force you to be in a relationship with them? You know, as a, as a man, like a, a couple, you know, man-wife relationship, husband-wife, boyfriend-girlfriend, whatever. Would you want somebody that's forced to be with you and says, well, you know, I don't love you, but I'll hang out. But God wants people to love him. He wants you to choose to love him. And he's given us the choice. He says, you don't have to love me. You don't even have to follow me. But there's consequences, either one. But follow me. He wants all people. He's not willing that any should perish. I just love that. That's why he's waiting so long to come back. Because there's so many that still don't know Jesus. And that's what we're here for, to continue to share that word with others and to tell others. Jesus is returning to take care of all the evil and the injustice in the world. And that's the final part of the message that the angel brings. And as he finishes, he said, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God. He's calling us to have patient endurance, to hang in there till the end, because then he'll make everything right again. Everything will be back like it was in the very beginning with no mistakes in it. Like little Annie says, and I want it like another morning with no mistakes in it already. Well, that's what God will bring, a world again with no, with no sin, everything perfect. And that's what we're looking forward to. Where are you in the picture on that fork? You're at the fork in the road today. Where are you? Are you on the road to heaven? No decision, as I said, is a decision. There are only two options. Today is a great day to make a decision. If you haven't made that decision yet, I would encourage you to choose. I would encourage you to go choose Jesus. Because I know when I chose him, it's made the world a difference in my life. It's changed so much, <laughs> it's just hard to imagine the direction I was going. And ended up here. It's amazing. It wasn't all easy. And most of my family will tell you, oh, not everything has gone simple and easy for us. But God has always been faithful. And I never have doubted it since I was 20 years old when I made that decision. And he will continue always to be faithful. You can even, and as I said, if you feel in God calling you to baptism today, please just come up to me or Terry or Jenny or Eric, and we'd be glad to talk to you today and help you to, and you can share your testimony at the river if you need to, but that's okay. We would love you to make that decision if that's your turn today, because that's the next step. Once you're a believer, being baptized is the second step for your faith. 
and we will con and we will always be here with you. We'll be here to support you and pray for you and encourage you. And that's what the church is all about. Um, we have life group tomorrow night at seven o'clock. And yeah, that's right. I think what tomorrow was is Monday. And we'll, we'll, we'll dig deeper and explore more of Revelations 14. So hope you can join us. If you can, we do have a Zoom link, too, if you can't get here in person. So hope you can come, and that's how we grow, and it's how we mature. Get past your fear. Don't just stand there. Make a decision. That's your, my challenge to you today. I'd like to pray with you. And as our worship team comes up, we'll close. And I'd like to pray with you, and I'd like to pray as well for any that are making that decision today to walk with God for the first time or to get back on track. Sometimes we wander off, and we need to get back where we're supposed to be. And if you'll pray that prayer with me, just please let me know. And we will talk to you and help you with your faith and help you to get grounded the direct, you know, on the right direction. Would you stand with us, please? Stand with me, please. Dear Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you for Keith. We thank you for Denise. And we thank you for Alex. As they're going to, as they've made a statement of faith this morning, as they have said that they want to get close to you, that they want to, they want to follow you, they want to put you first in all the parts of their lives, Father God. Lord, that's a heavy thing to, to pray on a Sunday morning. And, but, Lord, we know that you will equip them, that you will help them, that you will give them the power to live their lives faithfully in you. And, Lord, if there's one today that hasn't made that decision, that hasn't come to you and said, yes, I believe, I know I'm a sinner and I need you, Jesus. And I know that you died for me and that you love me and that you've taken my place. And if you want to make that choice today, if that one wants to say, pray that prayer today and say, Jesus, I believe and come in me and live in me forever, I, pray, I know you will. You are always faithful, Jesus. You always answer that prayer. And you always will redeem and you will always heal and make them whole again. And Lord, we pray that for each one here today. Pray that you will guide and direct and give us all your strength and your grace each day. Lord, thank you. Thank you for each one. Thank you for the testimonies we heard this morning. <clears throat> and Lord, we ask you to just fill each one of us with your Holy Spirit as we go your way this week and the rest of this day. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen.